Hey everybody, this is Stephen Gardner in Salt Lake City, Utah. I am the author of Taming Wall Street and I'm privileged today to have Denzel Rodriguez, the finance geek and velocity banking expert uh, on, the, on the call with me today. Denzel, thank you for, for allowing me to, to chat with you today. It's a privilege, it's an honor, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, your YouTube channel and people should definitely check that out. Part of what you do is in line with what I do, which is this infinite banking concept through properly designed cash value life insurance. And so as you've worked with uh, people over the years, uh, I know that you're an owner of this uh, as well as a, a teacher, but what, what would you say as, as you've had those conversations with people, what are the maybe the top three things that people like about the, the concept or the program? Um, so where I'm coming from on my YouTube channel, the, the big thing is debt. Like people are getting hammered with high interest credit card debts, uh, high interest car loans and student loans. So when they come across the, whether it's the velocity banking or, or infinite banking concept, they immediately see the ability to save a ton of money on the back end of interest, but then also actually preserve their money by being able to grow that money tax-free. So one of the big things for my clients is being able to save money tax-free uh, and then use it tax-free to essentially pay off all that bad debt that they have. And they basically recapture all that interest savings in the form of their, you know, their infinite banking policy. So that's like the top thing It's like being able to just shift the debt from high interest to zero and actually earn, you know, yeah. earn some money on the back end. So that's pretty cool. I like to, uh, you know, share with people, uh, you know, what if you could own your own debt and then be the recipient of those principal and interest payments. And then, and then we talk about like, okay, uh, what are the biggest buildings in your city? And it's almost always banks, right? Where do banks make their money? They make their money on mortgages, car loans, uh, you know, personal lines of credit, things like that. And so if you model what those banks are doing and you, you take on the debt, the thing I like about it is you're, you're not, doing a lot of risk because you're not taking on your uncle's debt or your uh your stepdad or, or you know wh whoever it is you're, you're taking on your own debt and the likelihood that you're going to default to yourself is pretty low right mm -hmm. and so owning that debt is uh is, is such a huge uh opportunity for people um have you have you found um that uh people using their policy once once it's capitalized and it's built up some equity is the number one thing you're seeing among your people using it as a line of credit yes yeah so very similar to the velocity banking concept where you know we're, we're using personal line of credit or credit card now they've you know been funding their policy for maybe two three four years they have some good amount of cash value in there very similar to probably the amount of credit limit they have on say all of their credit cards or their line of credit or HELOC. And now they see the value even more in terms of being able to take bigger amounts out of that cash to, to wipe out like big percentages of their mortgage debt or, or those big, big student loan debts that even just simply financing a vehicle, you know, through the policy, you know, so it's like if they, I, I often get asked the question, okay, if I have existing capital, like cash or stocks or whatever the case is, it's like I'm always asking them, how can I use that money more than once? You know, how can I use $1 more than once rather than a one shot, one kill? Yeah. If I have 30 grand in a savings account and I go throw it on a vehicle so that I can avoid the financing, avoid, you know, the, the, you know, that department, the financing department, and just outright own the car, the advantage is, yes, you own the car. You have no payments. The huge disadvantage, gone. You can never use it again. You can never recoup that money. It's gone. And you stop earning so, interest as soon as it comes out of the bank. Stop, you stop earning interest. You, you lose the value. Plus, 
what you bought is now a depreciating asset. Um, we understand that everybody needs a car to get around. Yes. But it's like, well, what if you could pay for the car up front and keep all that money in the process? And that's what infinite banking offers. It's like, Hey, I could just throw that 30 K in my policy, borrow against it and then pay myself back what I would the, the, the dealership, you know, yeah. on a monthly, whether it's a monthly basis or you pay yourself back once a year, however you like to structure, it really doesn't matter because you're, you're offsetting whatever the borrowing cost is from that insurance policy. Because even though you're getting charged in interest, when you borrow money out of a policy, you're also earning more than what you borrow. So there's an offsetting effect, zero borrowing costs. And guess what? You retained all the cash. You, you never lost it. You know, yeah. Once a, once, once a dollar passes through cash value, that dollar will continue to increase. It'll never go down. And that's the, that's the beauty behind all that. So yeah, definitely using policies like a, like a line of credit is very, very effective. Yeah. You know, um, last week I was speaking with somebody and I had mentioned to them that a, a survey showed that the average baby boomer is retiring right now with less than $50,000. And, you know, I don't know the average person's circumstances, but I, I have to think like, okay, you had a 40, 45 year career and you've only got, you know, maybe a thousand dollars to show for every year that you worked. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think about like, okay, what, what if you just bought, uh, like a, a 20, let's just say a, a $25,000 car, right? You, you buy that, you're able to recoup that, plus you're going to have a higher amount, right? As you just said, if people, you know, like let's say somebody's in their 30s and they live to their 90s, they're probably going to buy in, in excess of 10 cars, but let, let's just call it 10 cars, right? So you, you do that 10 times, 10 times 25,000, you would have a quarter of a million plus you know, significantly more than that because of the interest, you would probably have over 350,000 and that's just controlling and owning the debt on cars, right? Yeah. That, that's not real estate or, or anything like that. And so, uh, you know, those that are listening to this, that's the power of what we're, we're talking about is, you know, acting as the bank, becoming wealthier like the bank. Um, you know, it, it just ends up being such a powerful way uh, of growing money. But yeah, I mean, like when I, I was in my early, let's see, no, I was in my mid twenties when this concept uh, was first presented to me. And I, I remember I said to my wife, what if the secret to building wealth is just controlling your cars and the money going away from you over an entire lifetime? And she goes, well, not only that, but your car, my car, our three kids' cars, uh, maybe helping oh, with man. grandkids down the road. And, <laughs> and you can see, you know, you, you start picking up multiple programs that are compounding on your, on your behalf. Uh, it's really powerful to start catching a vision of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, another practical, you know, uh, example, uh, a real life example, on, you know, just like what you mentioned with using cars to basically not only fund your policy, but use it as a financing tool. And eventually, you know, recap all that cash. But my girlfriend is someone that, you know, just graduated college and now is looking at law school for around the, the fall. And we designed a, a policy where, you know, she's pretty much putting her savings in there right now. But when she starts getting loans for law school and scholarships, when she receives these chunks of cash that will come in again, instead of using that money to simply pay bills or let's say, let's say she wants to, you know, buy a car or, or get a lease or any type of uh, rent for when she, um, you know, lives, whether it be on campus or, or nearby, all of those major expenses, what I was, what we were, basically planning out was like, why don't we just send the scholarship money and the distributions from those loans that you get, throw it into the policy first, then just live out of the policy 
yeah. borrow what you need on a per semester you know basis and now she's paying now she'll be able to pay her rent if she has a car payment she'll be able to pay it um groceries food i mean it can she's literally funding a policy with money that she was gonna spend anyways yeah. and so it's like what we're both saying or bringing to the table is hey you're gonna spend that money no matter what the the average person like you said buys maybe 10 cars during their life you're gonna you're gonna buy these amount of cars you're gonna get a home eventually you're gonna acquire you know different maybe a boat you know um any type of equipment that costs you know a significant amount of money you could just simply run it through the policy first have that money sit and grow at a you know a guaranteed rate of return borrow it pay for the equipment it's paid. You didn't. You didn't use the credit card. You didn't. You didn't have to pay seventeen, twenty-five percent interest for it. Yeah. And then you just pay yourself back. So you're, what you're talking about, you're owning your own debt. You're just. You're yeah. just paying yourself back. Yeah. Like like you would an institution. No, that, you know? that, that, you know, that reminded me of a story uh, two two weeks ago in my, in my personal life. I'm also a, a a Christian minister, and I officiated a wedding for a couple that I've known. I've known the husband for about a decade. I've known the wife for about two years. Um, ironically, I've known them both longer than they've known each other. But <laughs> uh, as we went to the wedding dinner, I got to sit and, and talk with her dad. And he was the CEO of a hospital out in uh, California. And I, I was explaining what I do uh, for my clients. And he goes, oh yeah, I, I did that over 30 years ago. I go, any, any cool stories? And he goes, yeah, I guess I have one. He goes, when I was in college, I, I took some of that um, uh, scholarship money, I put it into my plan. And because oh, wow. I had had my plan for three years, I, I was you know, getting closer to break even. And then a, a, a friend's father called me and said, hey, do you want to put 10 grand down on a duplex in Lake Tahoe? And this is, in the, this is like in the mid 80s, right? And so uh, he's going to UCLA, he takes this money out, gives it to his, his best friend's father, and they buy this duplex together. And then two years ago, he sold it for $600,000, right? It's right by, the, right by Lake Tahoe in the mountains. Um, I've driven through there to San Francisco a couple of times. But he, you know, and he only got half of that because they went 50-50. Right. But still, he was like, you know, with, without doing much, other than checking up on it occasionally, this ten thousand dollar loan out of my plan blossomed over time into just over two hundred thousand dollars. I was like, "Oh man, I love hearing those stories." <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, it can you just really you can stun yourself. Um, and it's what's also fascinating to me because I'm young is the fact of how the concept has been practiced. I think that's what fascinates me more than anything. It's like you know, people are coming up with all different types of, you know, financial strategies to, you know, help improve their lives. But it's like, this one's like the foundational, rudimentary, fundamental principle strategy, and almost no one does it. Yeah. It's just, it fascinates me how long it's been in the game, you know? And yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some of these companies, uh, over a hundred years, I mean, you can, on the internet find hundreds of stories but you know like i think about sometimes uh like the pyramids of of egypt right mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't start with the pinnacle of the pyramid right they yeah. got this like really solid foundation bigger blocks uh and then once they had that they, they could start building those and my goodness five thousand years later they're still here right mm -hmm. where sometimes i think with stock market investing and and some of these riskier like startup funds and different things. It's like people are trying to in, invest in the highest risk and then, and then like have it trickle down to the solid stuff. And you know, some of that I don't think is their fault. I think it's bad financial education. Um, it's also, you know, 12 years of really, really ridiculously low interest rates at the bank. And, and so uh, like I, yesterday I was with um, a friend I, I went to high school with and he owns two of these plans for over a decade now. And just, you know, he was telling me, no, I, you know, I think I'll just take cash 
and buy the car and then I'll make the 539 payment back to myself at the bank. And I go, well, you've got a hundred grand in your plan. Why wouldn't you use your plan? He, he didn't understand the concept even after being in it for 10 years. And I said, why would you, why would you funnel money back to a bank account that's earning one tenth of a percent? And I said, the, the other thing is the, the majority of Americans uh, five or six years from now, they're going to want a new car. They're going to take from that fund and drop it and stop earning interest and, and start over. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I said, so why wouldn't you put that into something that's been averaging 5% or so uh, and doesn't have any tax on the growth instead of putting it into a, you know, a, a really paltry, pitiful uh, bank, but then getting a 1099 for the interest every year. And, and this light bulb went on and he was like, Oh man, I just, I like, I got to start using my money for my own benefit. I said, yes, take control of that. I, I'm not saying go do high risk things. I'm saying do things that you can control and have a predictable outcome on, but adds additional money to your bottom line and not of some banks. And it was really, it was really fun to, to see that, that light bulb go on and, and have that aha moment with him and his wife. Yeah. Yeah. That's super <laughs> cool. I love it. I'm sure you get that as you work with people uh, with their velocity banking debt reduction or, or as that, that concept crystallizes in their mind with the infinite banking program. Yeah, yeah. What, what, I, what I initially uh, try to get across in the very beginning is simply presenting that question. You know, can you currently, right now, in the situation that you're in, you know, without infinite banking, without velocity banking, can you currently use $1 more than once. As soon as I can get past that, that question where they can start thinking, well, can I, how, okay. I, that sense then now everything is going to fall in place, you know? So it's that, you know, can you use $1 more, more than once? And then the other thing is how do I borrow without having to, you know, pay a ton in interest? You know, like this, it's this concept of borrowing at 0%. You know, like, is that even true? Is that even possible? Is that a possibility? And it, it is, it really is. It really can work if you really take the time to just think a little bit differently, you know? And I always bring up borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. I'm like, all infinite banking does is we're borrowing from Peter, who's going to charge us nothing. And we're giving it to Paul, who was charging us a ton of interest or uh, points, you know, if they're a money lender or whatever the case is. And then we're owning what Peter owns, right? So we borrow from Paul to buy what Peter owns, whether it's the car, the, the home, whatever it is. Now we own it. It's ours. Now it's going to appreciate in value if it's an asset or, or whatever the case may be. And we removed all the interest up front that Peter was charging us. And now we pay Paul back. Paul in this equation was us. Yes. So we're Paul. <laughs> we're borrowing from ourselves to pay Peter so that we don't have to pay Peter any interest. Peter's the institution, right? Or the, or the, the, um, the consumer debts and whatever you want to use. And we're just recouping all that interest and the cash flow. The yes. payment, the actual payment that you were making is now coming back to you. You now yeah. own the payment. You own the asset. It's yours forever. You never lose. Uh, as soon as I can get past that, yeah. then it's like, you know, smooth sailing from there. Yeah. You know, and then they're like all in at that point. That, that reminds me of, uh, there's a part in my book, Taming Wall Street. And I, I shared this because this is, this is when the light bulb went off for me is the, the gentleman showed how to do this on your own cars. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I grasped the concept. Then he showed how it gets even better with real estate. And I was like, mm. I'm sure smoke was coming out of my ears. And he goes, once you see this, you can't unsee it. You would have to purposely ignore it, right? And then he goes, have you ever noticed that in the FedEx logo, between the E and the X, there's a secret arrow that they put in there. And then, he, and then he put up a picture of FedEx 
And, and there's that little arrow between the, the E and the X. And I was like, oh my gosh. Now, every time I see FedEx, I see the arrow first and then mm -hmm. the FedEx logo, right? right? It's the same thing when I go to buy cars or, or show people, I want them to go, wait a minute. The bank has been advertising to me like crazy with the FedEx, but I've got the arrow that's going to move me forward, right? And, and, and so I want, I want that to get in people's minds every time they make that payment, right? You've got to make the payment to somebody. So if you're going to take money out of your pocket and hand it over to the bank, why not take money out of your pocket and put it in your other pocket, right? And, mm -hmm. and own and control that debt. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful, man. It's, it's exciting too. It's really, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. Uh, and there's a huge um, satisfaction from the, from the customer, from the client, you know, us as teachers and whoever we're working with, whoever, whoever's listening, whoever decides, you know, who you, whoever you want to work with. It's like, once you really start absorbing the concept and applying it, you know, there's, there's really no losing from yeah. there. It's just, it's just a matter of how you, you know, it goes back to financial management, of course, you know, if, if I'm, you know, no concept I should say is, you know, bulletproof because it's really the, the person, yeah. you know, I could have the, I can have the perfect policy set up and the perfect design and the best dividend, the best company. I can have all of it. But if the person is not in line, then they can destroy the policy. Yeah. You know, they can, they can ruin it. Yeah. Not, not uh, using it the way it's intended um, can have negative consequences. Right. Yeah, um, sure. Why, you know, I have an opinion on this, but I'm just kind of curious your thoughts and then we'll wrap this up. But, why, what do you think is the number one reason more people don't get involved in infinite banking? Um, I, I want to compare it to, I should say, like working out or I also want to use the analogy of what Robert Kiyosaki uses on the cash flow quadrant, how, 95 plus percent live on the E and the S side, you know, the, they're an employee or self-employed and like 1% of the population are on the B and the I business owner and an investor. That transition is probably the most difficult thing someone will do in their life is transition from a system to another system, you know, uh, it's, I also want to use a, a biblical uh, reference with the story of how Moses freed all those people from Egypt. So they went from one system of bondage, um, slavery, and they were being tortured and killed and just horrendous stuff. And then Moses removes them from that system, like, immediately. Right. So they didn't even get a chance to like understand. They just, they quickly transitioned to freedom. And now they're in the desert of unknown. They're yes. in the under in an unknown territory. So it's just like infinite banking. People are in a system. Now they're on our YouTube channel. They're in your uh, zone. They're seeing people like you and I talking a totally different language totally different environment, a freedom environment, a financially free environment. They're in the desert. They're in the unknown. Yeah. Most people think they want to flee back to their system. Yes. So you can imagine these people that fled slavery, fled bondage, torture, women being raped, kids being killed at childbirth, whatever it was. And they told Moses, you sent us to the desert. There's no food, there's no water, no shelter. We want to go back yeah can you believe that <laughs> at least our bellies were full you know <laughs> at least right at least we had uh, uh some clothes and we had you know food and they were taking care of us that is what the financial institution here in the united states has done to majority of the cultures that live here in the united states is you've been you know strapped down to this system yeah. that everybody knows and then you've got that one Moses guy. You got that yeah. one person that <laughs> is like slowly but surely transitioning people from one side to the other. And I think that is a, a big reason why 
people don't make that transition that jump over because it takes a leap of faith yeah it takes it takes risk uncertainty you know and a, and a, you know you have to have a level of faith to actually believe in a person like you and i to you know see that see it come through you know yeah. plant that plant that seed and watch it manifest and create the harvest yeah no that that's a that's a great analogy i think um it is uh we've been I don't eh, maybe brainwash is, is too aggressive, but we've definitely been conditioned to believe that banks have our best interest at heart. They're trying to get us the lowest rate or the best uh, growth rate. And at the end of the day, they're just looking out for their bottom line and they make a ton of money off of a lot of people and they understand controlling that debt and that cash flow stream. And we, 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 you know, we shouldn't, be mad at them. We just need to mimic what they do. Uh, right. We, we do not need to be mad at the system at all because just like infinite banking, well, in, in the system of the banks, we have velocity banking. So it's like, I love the banks. They give me all the debt in the world that I could possibly want at any given time. They offer me 0%. They offer me cash back. They offer me liquidity and usage and the ability to maximize my cash or economize my economy my own economy and so i can't get mad at them because it's not like they only have one option it's yeah. just that it's just that they train their people to sell a certain thing because it makes them the most money there's also the other side of the equation kind of like you know like what grant cardone and we both both of us both of us follow him and he's the same way. He's on the other side with the banks where the yeah. banks go, the banks go to him yeah. for, for deals yeah. and big, big real estate investments and things like that. So it's like, why not just get on that side of the bank? So again, yeah. making that transition from the E and the S to the B and the I. Yeah. You know, well, one, one last thought, uh, just to piggyback, you know, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before you did something about, don't be afraid of these, these bank tools, right? Just learn how to use them to your advantage. And what most people don't know is one of the greatest tools that banks have is these cash value life insurance plans. Uh, like Bank of America has over $19 billion in their tier one capital. Now tier one capital is the guaranteed lowest risk money that the bank must have in order to keep their bank charter. And, and these banks are buying billions and billions of dollars of this product. They're using it to their advantage. They're getting the tax advantages. They're getting the leveraged upside. And, uh, you know, but most people don't know that bank, even banks are doing what we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so, right. uh, you know, just to end it, don't, don't be afraid to use these, these tools that the banks have uh, or that the banks are using because obviously it's led to uh, a massive amount of wealth in their in their coffers and it can it can lead to a massive amount of wealth in our economy as well for sure so totally agree. hey i, I want to thank you for uh taking time out of your day you know we, we uh tried to make this happen we're both so busy uh, and uh i'm glad that we were able to do that uh, if someone wants to uh you know learn from you and and uh learn more about what you do what's what's the best way for them to to find you um, I would have everyone uh, check out my YouTube channel. That's where I put all of my content on a weekly basis. I'm constantly talking about velocity banking, infinite banking, and kingdom authority. So Denzel Rodriguez, you just type that in. Um, I'll be probably the first one that comes up there. You'll okay. see my face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I came across it. So uh, if anybody wants to learn more about what I do, I'm Stephen Gardner. You can check out my YouTube channel or go to yourbridgeplan.com. But thank you again, Denzel, for taking time to, to speak to me about, you know, what we believe is a, a really powerful concept for uh, controlling our wealth, building our own kingdoms and, and getting ahead in life. So thank you again for taking time. Thank you. God bless. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.